are listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin for supporting The Coffee Hour. Find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live Uncommon. We have a new friend joining us today, yes. new to Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. Well, new to position at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. Joining us today, Dr. Ronald Mudge. He's Provost, Chief Academic Officer and Professor of Exegetical Theology at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. Dr. Mudge, welcome to the Coffee Hour. Thank you. Good morning. Well, it's uh, it's fun to get to introduce new people and to learn about their background. So tell us a little bit about your history and your journey into becoming a church worker. Probably junior high school, I first started thinking about what I might do for a living. And at that point, I was thinking that I might be a teacher. In fact, I was thinking that I might be a math teacher. I had interacted with other students in class and sometimes would help them to learn things and that would be exciting. And uh, so it seemed like a good fit. But then the more I thought about it, the more I thought that it might get kind of dull after a while, <laughs> that math doesn't change much. It's, there's a nice consistency to math, uh, you predictability to math, but you, you just do the same thing over and over again. So then I was thinking, and this is taking me more into high school, I was thinking that I might be an English teacher, because then we would study literature. We would talk about the human condition and read great books and talk about how those affect us. And then that led me more to think, well, the greatest book is the Bible. And the most important things that affect us are in God's word. And so that, that whole thought process led me to thinking about ministry. And of course, along the way, I had a lot of interaction with people from church and my family, pastors, a lot of prayer time and Bible study, and the Lord pushed all that together to the point where I settled on be, becoming a pastor. What was your journey like after you went to seminary? You've done a, you've done a lot of things between seminary, seminary, and then and now being called to the seminary. What was that? What was what were those years like after seminary? Well, during seminary, my wife Lisa and I met, and we were married at the end of my vicarage year and then together for my fourth year. And our first call then was to serve in Ivory Coast, West Africa as, as missionaries. And we spent about 10 years, we were in Ivory Coast and then also in Togo, French speaking West Africa is the common theme there. Came back to the seminary for a while for me to do coursework and get started on my dissertation for my PhD. And then I received a call to serve as a professor at Concordia University, Wisconsin, teaching especially Greek, Hebrew, Bible content, also some missions and French in there. And then after a couple of years there, I started working as pre-seminary director there as well. Those are the big steps. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about, I, I want to go back to your time serving as a missionary in Africa. What was the focus of your of the work that you were given to do in Cote d'Ivoire? My, my focus was on theological education. And it was kind of an interesting and exciting situation where there were a bunch of pretty much spontaneous churches that were planted. There, there was a civil war in Liberia, the country right next door, and people fled into Ivory Coast and started up churches. And then we got involved, the LCMS got involved. And the big need that we saw was that there were no leaders, much less pastors. So they would be meeting together. And uh, it was my privilege and joy to be able to work with them with resources that would help people get into God's word, to form their faith by learning the catechism, understand what happens in a, a worship service, why we have a service, why we do what we do, what the Lord is doing in that ser service, and then just give them a basic foundation. They then would choose leaders who would continue an education and eventually go to the seminary in northern Togo to study to become pastors. Mm -hmm. Who were the people that you were able to work with being a missionary in French-speaking West Africa for 10 years? I'm sure you were able to build some relationships with people there. Yeah, lots of wonderful relationships. There, there may be different ways of organizing people. We got to know <laughs> people in, in Cote d'Ivoire. We got to know people in Togo. We got to know people of different language groups and ethnic groups. It, it was mostly the church leaders in Cote d'Ivoire 
who spent a lot of time with me and we developed strong relationships. Also in Togo then, we moved to Togo later on and got to know them well. One of them, his Gary name is Kamat and his French name is Désiré, helped me to learn the Gary language. And so in some ways he was like a father to me, especially since I spoke like a child at the beginning. <laughs> in fact, there was one point where I was trying to say something to someone in Gary and he changed it a little bit. And then he said, he's like my child. And when you're three-year-old babbles, you know what he means. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm curious, you, since you brought it up, the different languages mm -hmm. you've learned, can you give us a list of the languages you've studied and <laughs> that are able to use even maybe still today? My, my English is very good. My French is still quite good. I studied that in college and then used it a lot for the 10 years when we were in West Africa, using it to preach and converse and all of that. My, my Gary is a little rusty. I got to the point where I would, with some help, I would write out a sermon and then read the sermon, what, in a, in an engaging way. So it wasn't just a monotone, but I wasn't quite good enough that I would, was comfortable preaching without having really serious notes. And then more academically, I've studied Greek, Hebrew, German, Latin. Aramaic. Hmm. So just a few languages. Just, just a couple. Yeah. yeah. It's the first one that's the hardest. Learning French, I learned the categories for grammar, what you look for in a language. And then there are languages that, that mess you up. So English and French put a lot of stress on tense. Did it happen in the past? Did it happen in the future? Or whatever. Interestingly, both Hebrew and Gare tend to be more concerned on whether it's a completed action or not, whether it's thought of as done or still ongoing. And the sense of past, present, or future is less stressed, less clearly marked in those languages. Huh. That is, that is fascinating. I love learning these little tidbits about things. What are some other things that you learned in your during your time in Africa that you've been able to kind of make some connections once you were back in the States at Concordia, Wisconsin? Just a couple of things. I think the biggest one is that people all the world over need the grace of Jesus and receive it with joy and rejoice when they've been saved by Jesus Christ. And that the human life in many ways is we just spend our whole lives experiencing the grace of Jesus and having Jesus shape us by that grace so that he teaches us how to treat others and to live by that grace and to live it out as we relate to other people. In the African context, I saw and I saw a lot of love. I received a lot of love. I gave a lot of love. Many Africans have an attitude, as this would be non-Christian Africans too, but many Africans have an attitude of life is tough and you're going to need as much help as you can get. And so you give as much help as you can get. If there's an opportunity to be helpful to another person, then you definitely do that. And I don't know how many times people were helpful to me. I was often lost. <laughs> there aren't a lot of street signs in Africa. So I was often lost and people would help me to find my way. There, there were times where I was ill and people cared for me. There, there was a time when I was riding an old motorcycle that would stall and people would volunteer to push it. So people were just very helpful. And then when the gospel comes in and transforms a person's life, even more helpful and more focused on, on showing love and concern for others. I think the other thing that, that really stood out to me was the value of theological education, that God's word is, is deep, that there's a lot there. It, it takes work to really get in there and understand it. And the Lord uses law and gospel to, to shape us as he's drowning, fighting against our sinful nature and working through the power of the Holy Spirit to lead us to live as he would have us live, to speak his grace and to show his grace to other people. That's all in the context of, of knowing his word well. That's how we know him. So you went from Togo to Mequon, is that right? Yes, there was a short stop in St. Louis along the way, but yes. <laughs> so you went from like really warm temperatures in Togo <laughs> to stop no. in St. Louis to Mequon, Wisconsin. Did your wardrobe change very quickly? Yes. Yes, it did. Yeah. Well, I mean, let me talk about the stop in St. Louis because we were here in the summer. And if you're outside in the summer in St. Louis, it's maybe 90 degrees. And if you go inside in the, the buildings of the seminary, 
the air conditioning on it is on maybe 60 degrees. And so I would carry around a wool sweater <laughs> that I would put on when I would go inside because it's distracting when I shiver in front of people. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> So uh, stopping in St. Louis a Seminary here, it, it, it reminds me of theological education, and that's what you're involved with now. Why is theological education so important to you? It was a part of what you were doing in Africa, in, in West Africa, as what, were you, what you were doing in, at Concordia, Wisconsin, and now at the seminary in St. Louis. Why is this so central to the vocation the Lord has given you? Well, the Lord has worked in me in such a way that I enjoy it immensely. Let me just admit that from the get-go. <laughs> it's just it's one of those things. He wouldn't have to make it pleasant for me, but he, yep. for whatever reason, however he works, I find it very fulfilling to study theology. And I think that this comes to back to what I was saying a moment ago, that we really spend a lifetime learning the grace of Jesus, living by the grace of Jesus. And that's the word teaches us that. Studying theology teaches us that. And if we don't dig in deep. And if the word doesn't impact us heavily, there's this easy temptation to think in terms of somehow saving ourselves. And we end up in a situation where we're trying to contribute to our own salvation. And then we feel terrible because we know we're not doing a good job of it. And so God's word keeps driving us back to that grace where we receive it entirely as a gift that we're all equal. Every human being is sinful and deserving, deserving of death and hell. And give those of us who are saved, we receive the grace of Jesus, we accept him, we're saved entirely as a gift, and that's our foundation for living. And then as Christians uh, who've been saved by Jesus, as we get into his word, that teaches us how to get along with others. It teaches us how to relate to our culture. There are many challenges in the culture and temptations to do things that would not be part of God's plan. So sex outside of marriage, for example, if we didn't read God's word, if we didn't have any background in that, we wouldn't know that's not God's plan. And so we know what God's plan is through his word. And then his word prepares us to engage our culture and the world around us with that. And this, this, the case specifically of those who we pastors or deaconesses for, for the church, serve, excuse me, serve the church formally, that Theology is it's the nuts and bolts of our work. It's the toolbox. It's what we reach into to be able to serve others. So a pastor's preparing a service. He's preparing the liturgy, involved in, in, in planning the hymns, preparing his sermon. He's digging deeply into God's word for that sermon, studying the Greek, Hebrew, whatever, whichever it may be, dealing with the theological issues, the doctrines that come up in, in those passages, and forming the whole service to, to deliver let's use a food analogy to deliver a hearty meal <laughs> through the service. Amen. Amen. We're talking with the Reverend Dr. Ronald Mudge. He's provost and chief academic officer and professor of exegetical theology at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. We'll continue the conversation in just a moment. You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. At Concordia University, Wisconsin, we believe you were created for a reason, to use your God-given gifts to help others, to live a life of self-sacrifice in a me-first world, to live a life that's uncommon. Whether you're taking one of 50-plus online programs or learning with us in person on the shores of Lake Michigan, you'll be equipped to make an uncommon impact. Learn more at cuw.edu. Concordia University, Wisconsin. Live uncommon. Welcome back to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. Our guest today, the Reverend Dr. Ronald Mudge. He's provost, chief academic officer, and professor of exegetical theology at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. I'm really enjoying learning about your history as a theological educator and being a theology professor. What is the area of theology that you enjoy studying the most? Well, my, my area of expertise is exegetical theology, and I'm very comfortable there. I love studying God's Word in, in, in any way that I might do it. I love digging into the Greek and the Hebrew to learn from the grammar of God's Word. 
I love studying different translations, the English translations, French translations, and to see how others have presented it there. And then talking through exactly the message that God's delivering to us and how it applies to our lives. So just a super simple example with the Greek. In English, when I say you, you don't know whether I'm talking about one person or many. Our singular and plural is the same. I suppose we can get into y'all and all y'all, but oftentimes it's unclear whether we're talking to one people, one person, many, but in the Bible, it's always clear. In the New Testament, there's one word for you singular, and there's a different word for you plural. And so sometimes we ask ourselves, is Jesus talking just to Peter or is he talking to all the disciples or something like that? And the answer is right there in the Greek. It's a little hard to convey in the English. So what are you, what are you teaching at the seminary? Right now I'm teaching a Hebrew lab and we meet and translate. We've been translating from Genesis. We're about halfway through the semester so far. We're going to change gears and go into Deuteronomy pretty soon. But we read some of Joseph's history, which is really quite striking, starting off with Genesis 37, where he's his dad's favorite. He gets special treatment. He's kind of a snitch and he's not very self-aware. He's the kind of guy who would tell a story that says, I had a dream that you're all going to bow down to me. Isn't that awesome? And not realize that other people, you know, his siblings might not love that. <laughs> <laughs> and then we go through his brothers overreacting. I like to say where I come from, we might wrestle you to the ground or shake you up or do something to embarrass you a little bit to get revenge. We don't sell people into slavery where I come from, but that's what, uh, that's what the brothers did. And then he's falsely accused. He spends years in prison and it, his faith just quietly grows as he continues to trust the Lord under all these circumstances. He gets a chance to see his brothers again. And that brings to them the mind of to their minds, what they did, the whole way he interacts with them. They don't know he's Joseph, but they get thinking about Joseph. And then God uses that to protect the whole family. After Jacob dies, the brothers go to Joseph and say, don't kill us. <laughs> and, uh, and Joseph says, I'm not going to kill you. I'm going to care for you. You're in God's hands. You intended to hurt me. God used it to accomplish good. That's faith. That's the two parts of faith. As we live out faith, we're trusting the Lord under the most difficult of circumstances. He doesn't have to do it our way. We still trust him. And we ourselves live by his grace. And we know that others live by his grace. And we convey that grace to them. So now we know what you're about as a professor of theology. What is a provost? What's the work of a provost? <laughs> right. right. Yes. That's a fun word. I, you tell someone you're a provost. Because I, I'm used to this. If I want to end conversations, I tell people, I teach Greek and Hebrew, and they really don't know what the next question to ask in the conversation is after that. It must be hard. <laughs> it's all great. So I say provost, and people either smile and go talk to someone else or Asked what a provost is, I say chief academic officer, and then they either smile and go talk to someone else, or they say, "What's a chief academic officer?" Basically, it's in as the provost, I oversee all things academic at Concordia Seminary St. Louis, which, as you can imagine, for a seminary is an awful lot. That includes mundane but important things like budget for our academic work. It also includes something much less mundane, and one of the things I find very exciting: identifying excellent candidates. So when a, a professor retires, finding someone to come in with a wonderful skill set that the Lord has given to him to become part of our community and to contribute to our community by getting to know people, caring for people, and of course, teaching extraordinarily well. Then what's probably the most obvious part that I I oversee, well, for these areas I'm going to talk about now, there's an excellent person who's paying much more attention than I am to each area. <laughs> has more experience, has been doing this for a while and really knows what it's about, but I'm there to be supportive and helpful and help the different parts work together. So one part is our MDiv curriculum. The classes that we have students take, we're always shaping those to give them the best formation, the best education possible here. I mentioned our Greek and Hebrew labs. We, we stress Greek and Hebrew and we're going to stress it more and more. We really, we want our students to be in the habit and be well able to read Greek and Hebrew with some help, so with a grammar beside them and a, a lexicon, but to be able to use the Greek and Hebrew after they, they graduate. We also have labs 
where students meet to spend time getting to know each other. And we consciously put students together who come from different backgrounds so they can get to know people from different backgrounds and re respect and appreciate the differences while they also, of course, appreciate the similarities that we have all receiving the grace of Jesus. So I'm involved in overseeing that. Also the graduate school, so our PhD, MDiv, I'm sorry, M MA, masters and such. Another one of my favorites is enrollment. So we're we have an, a team that invites people to come and study with us. We, we're looking to connect with junior high and high school kids to get them thinking about that, especially college-age students, so that at the right time they would apply and come and study with us to be pastors or deaconesses, and second career students as well, people in their 20s and 30s, 40s, and so on. We want to invite them to come and study with us, and if the Lord leads them, help them through that process. I'm involved with the library. That's part of our academic activity. Our, our scholarly work in communications, we have some online materials and our professors publish. We host events on camp. We also have to be accredited, and that maybe isn't one of my favorite things, but we want to do it very well. We teach in an excellent fashion, and accreditation is a matter of just demonstrating that for the people when they come to visit, show that we know what we're doing with our teaching. And I, I also work with the, the dean of the faculty, who's keeping an eye on the faculty, making sure they're staying healthy, representing their needs and such. So it's these sorts of things that I'm doing. Very good. That is a long list of things that you're doing. And uh, it sounds like you're really enjoying it. Sounds and, easy. I'm yeah. Sure. <laughs> super, super, like, but, you know, yeah. Let, let me just say that for each one, there's someone else who's primarily responsible. And those folks are doing great jobs. And they're so kind to me to teach me how things are working, how I can be helpful, how we can work together as a team to do great things for the seminary and for our students. Yeah, it sounds like very exciting things happening. So we have just about a minute and a half left or so. And as we do when we introduce new people on the KFUO radio, we like to do a bit of a lightning round just to get to know you a little bit better. So are you ready for the lightning round? As ready as I will ever be. <laughs> <laughs> All right. First, what's your favorite food? Linguine and clam sauce. Okay. All right. Favorite book, and we assume everyone's favorite book is the Bible, but in addition to that, do you have a favorite book? Two We Have Faces by C.S. Lewis. Oh, that is wow. a good one. I like that one. Okay. It's uh, heavy. It's heavy. It is heavy. It's, it's not, it's not maybe for a beginner, but it's a good book. It is a very good book. All right. Favorite movie? Oh, boy. That's super hard. So... <laughs> So I really like the basketball movie Hoosiers. Uh -huh. <laughs> there are just some nice things in there about the way people relate to each other and mm. effort and just something about it that, that I like. I, I like a lot of movies, but that's the one that's coming to mind now. Okay. Dessert, favorite dessert or ice cream, if you want to zero in on a specific <laughs> category. Yeah, actually, Ted Drew's has what they call a Johnny Rabbit, which is like chocolate covered cherries smashed and put into a concrete. That is hands down my favorite dessert. Ooh, that sounds good. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Favorite vacation destination. We go to Door County in Wisconsin. It's just, mm. it's a quiet, restful area. We take long walks in state parks. We listen to Lake Michigan and pretend it's an ocean and we just generally have a good time. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. This one is a fun one. This is Sarah's contribution to the list. <laughs> Favorite office supply. <laughs> you know what? I don't even know the name of it, but the thing that you use to pull out staples when you miss staples. Yes. Yeah. I a love that thing remover. because it can also be a weapon. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you have to be like close contact, right? Hand-to-hand -hand combat or something, but having yeah, one of those like could a make a difference. Yes, it has like little teeth on it. Looks like an That's animal. Hilarious. Yes. Okay, this is one of the very unfair questions, but we're asking it anyway. Favorite hymn? That yeah, that's really difficult. I'm going to say "Thy Strong Word," okay. but there are plenty others in the run. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Bible verse, and I know you're a professor of theology, so <laughs> all of all them. All of them. <laughs> What's the one at top of mind? Ephesians two. I'll go ahead and do eight, nine, and 10 if I can. If I can't, then it would just be eight and nine. Eight and nine make it so, so clear that we're saved only and entirely by grace. And I like 10 then because it helps us to sort out grace and works. So God wants us to do works. It has nothing to do with our salvation. So he saves us 
Salvation, if you, you go to the salvation door, you go to the grace door for salvation, you go to an entirely different place when it's works, but God wants us to do it. Mm, amen. There you have it, Reverend Dr. Ronald Budge, <laughs> Provost, Chief Academic Officer and Professor of Exegetical Theology at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. Welcome back to St. Louis, Dr. Mudge. Great to have you on the Coffee Hour today. Thank you. You're listening to the Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support the Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you anytime, anywhere.